Warm greetings and humble salutations. Peace be unto you in your respective places. I am George Anthony Pratt, a second year history and religion double major hailing from Jacksonville, Florida. And it is my esteemed pleasure to welcome you to this Thurman Thursday celebration of homecoming week. We remember the words of brother and luminary, the Reverend Dr. Howard Washington Thurman, valedictorian of the class of 1923, to serve as a guiding light in navigating our present reality in a landscape where the destruction of the black body is tradition. As we strive to preserve our bodies enduring the continuous violence inflicted upon them, let our souls not be dwarfed, but uplifted by this Afro hermeneutic and Thurman meditation. This is an excerpt from the chapter Reconciliation of Disciplines of the Spirit. And it reads Violence feeds on fear as its magic source of energy. The fear it engenders in those against whom it is directed. As long as persons react to it with fear, their lives can be controlled by those in whose hands the instruments of violence rest. It is important in the etiquette of violence that the fear be centered around one physical life and well-being or that of one's loved ones. By every cunning contrivance and subtlety, emphasis must be placed upon physical existence as the supreme good. All the conditioning that has gone into human, humanity's survival on the planet is in favor of such an emphasis. Once this is established, the only thing remaining for violence is to threaten to kill. If the highest premium is placed upon life, the fear of its loss or injury enables violence to maintain itself in active control over the lives of others. If there is no fear at this point, then the power of violence is critically undermined. Ashe. It is a privilege to introduce our speaker for today. The Reverend Stephen A. Green, a graduate of the class of 2014. He currently serves as the social justice pastor at Greater Allen Cathedral in Jamaica, Queens, New York, and chair of Faith for Black Lives. He previously served as the national director of the youth and college division of the NAACP. As one of the nation's youngest leading civil rights advocates and activists, Reverend Green has led mobilizations and nonviolent direct action campaigns across the country. Without any further delay, we will now hear from the Reverend Stephen A. Green. Well, thank you so much, my dear friend, uh, Brother George Pratt. It has been an honor and a privilege to watch you ascend into leadership and to continue to be the vibrant light that you are to our community and to our college. Uh, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to be with the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel at our beloved Morehouse College tonight for this homecoming uh, Thurman Thursday. Uh, I want to first bring greetings to my beloved dean and mentor and advisor, uh, the sage of our time, the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Edward Carter Sr. I wanna thank him for this gracious opportunity to return home to Morehouse College. Homecoming is a special time in the life of the college and her sons are invited back home to return to the place that nurtured us. And so I'm grateful to be able to come to my intellectual home, to be able to journey with these brilliant minds and the leadership of the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, International Chapel Assistance Program. We give greetings also to our Associate Dean, the Reverend Quincy Reinhardt, and then also to our beloved President, Mr. Gabriel Cloud. 
Like many of you, I wish to have been seated around the Lucian table on this fall Thursday night as we engage in critical conversation where we decide where we're going to go for the pregame for this weekend's activities. Nevertheless, we are here and to ties more brotherly in a unique way, in a different way. Uh, we gather during this critical moment in our nation's history because it's at this moment that the character of our nation is called into question. As we most prominently have to wrestle with where do we go from here? We are facing the ugly beauty of a young nation that is still trying to make herself true to the ideals she espoused while yet revealing more of who she ultimately is. This election is on the heels of the government's failure to manage the greatest health crisis in a century, the coronavirus that has taken and impacted the lives of over 7 million people, caused over 216,000 deaths. Notably, the CDC reported today that nearly all of the deaths affecting children were black and Latino. From generation to generation, we are called to wrestle with the difficult reality that the power of the vote and the likelihood of our survival are tethered together in this yet to be United States of America. We recognize that over this summer, as we dealt not only with the pandemic of COVID-19, but the pandemic of COVID-16-19, that there has been no legislation, federal legislation has been passed uh, at a federal level to directly respond to the rebellions and took place in the streets this summer as the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor shook the very core of this nation. The partisan political gridlock highlights the stark polarization of ideologies that only continues to hurt the most vulnerable. So when we say vote or die, we mean that we are in a desperate struggle to live in this nation and that it is either liberty or death. We mean that the vote is our most critical tool within the arsenal to protect and to defend this democracy. We must engage in the vote by all expressions, by all means that are available to us. And tonight we recognize that the vote is not the ultimate answer, but that the vote is a tool. It is a part of an ultimate answer to be able to speak to the very realities of our nation. We must tether our vote not to personalities, but to policies. And so we recognize that this election is not just about the last four years. It is truly about the last 400 years that we are constantly reckoning with the reality that we are still suffering from the legacies of slavery in this country, that COVID-19 exposed the racial health gap and the racial wealth gap that African-American people are disproportionately affected by this virus and because of our comorbidities and dealing with the realities of our own, our own, our own pre-existing conditions that are results of our own environmental realities. And so, friends, we are, are seeing that the, the, the cover that has been over the eyes of our people that has thought that, that, that active civic engagement was our only solution. We thought that when we saw the progress that we, we, we witnessed on that fateful day in November the 4th, 2008, when President Barack Obama was elected president because of our civic engagement, because of the way we turned out at the polls, we, we saw that happen again when we, fall, we saw the attack of the GOP on healthcare and ACA in order to protect the President Obama's legacy. We, we, we showed up at the polls again in 2012, believing that civic engagement was going to push us towards our freedom. And yet we have not seen the sizable investment that is necessary for black life to be sustained in this country. Once again, in 2016, we showed up at the polls, recognizing the existential threat that, jo that uh, Donald Trump presented to this nation. And we showed up, Black people single-handedly showed up to try to affirm and uphold our ideals of democracy. And now, once again, the cover is being lifted from our eyes so that we can see that it is not just a vote. It is voting and it is voting plus we must move beyond the vote 
And so I want us to wrestle, wrestle with that tonight. That this election, vote or die, is about what happens beyond the vote. That voting is either going to be the tool to you, we're going to use to in, embrace and to fulfill and to make this democracy what she shall be, or we will die a fateful death. Which means that this election is so critical because we are, 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 are at a breaking point. We are at a, 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 a bridge point and that our survival as a people, our survival as humanity is tethered to what happens at the ballot box. So my friends, we must realize that we must take a step beyond the vote, that on November the 3rd, we are just beginning to chart a destiny toward what this will look like. We will not give up. We will not relent. But we must recognize that on November the 4th, we must mobilize as strongly, as intensely, as profusely, as profusely as we have done for November the 3rd. We must recognize that what happens on November the 4th charts a destiny towards where we will go in the future, that November the fourth is the dawn of a new day. That is the day that shall live in infamy, not what happens on that night single-handedly alone, but how we, what shall we become on the day after? What will we be on the day after? What nation will emerge on the other side of this crisis? Who shall we become on November the fourth? November the fourth is the day that we decide which trajectory we will take this nation. Will we decide to begin anew? Will we decide to hold those in leadership accountable to advance a, a, an agenda of reparative justice? Will we hold the next president accountable that in the next 100 days, we need a systematic investment into black communities, not just with black exploitative capitalism, but with reparative justice in the form of reparation. Reparations for the descendants of those who built this nation on the backs of enslaved labor. We must recognize that we need a critical economic investment in black communities. That the wealth gap will dissipate. That, that the, the racial wealth of black Americans will move to zero dollars by 2050. If we do not do something in the interim, we must do something very in a very short time, the likelihood of the 9 million people who are now in poverty as a result of COVID-19 is on the line. The threats of our health care is on the line. Who shall we become as a people is on the line. And my dear friends and colleagues and Morehouse brothers and friends who are watching on this program tonight, we are in a state of emergency. We are on the threshing floor of what the dawn of a new day shall become. And as a result, we must do the work that it takes to improve, to enhance, and to ensure that the survival of our people, the survival of freedom-loving people, the survival of those who have had their backs against the wall, the survival of those who are the most vulnerable, the survival of the oppressed, the survival of the sun-kissed children in this nation, the survival of the black and brown children who are being held at the border as their mothers are being, are being surgically infringed upon, and that the survival of humanity, the survival of the entire planet, the survival of our cosmos, the survival of human existence wrestles and rests upon the very fact that what we do to uphold our future democracy, what we do to help chart the pathway to ensure that every vote will count, that we ensure that voter intimidation that is to take place at these polls will not, uh, will not squander our votes. We must ensure that all of the lawyers that the president has, has, has instilled on these courts will not have the last say so, that while yet we understand that the pandemic and the problem wrestles and rests in America, there is still a promise that the people 
who hold the moral agency, the people who have the convictions of consciousness, the people who decide that they are going to pray with their feet are going to have to mobilize themselves and organize themselves and recognize that, yes, we know that there are three branches of government. There, there is a fourth one that exists, and that is the soul of the people of this nation who make up the very fabric of this nation, and we must mobilize the soul of humankind. To redeem and save this democracy. It means we've got some difficult days ahead. It means that we must pay attention and ensure that every vote counts. It means that we must sound the alarm when we see draconian uh, tactics take place as we watched in California with alternative mail-in drop-in ballot boxes have been put in place. We must ensure that we, the people, will monitor our government's next steps because the power that the government has the cons comes from the consent of the governed. And so those of us who are of conscience and compassion was recognized that we must sound the alarm, engage in nonviolent, moral, militant resistance. It means that some of us have to place our bodies on the line. It means that many of us may be in call to engage in strikes of non-cooperation. We may have to pull our resources from the institutions that continue to monopolize on our freedom and be silent in the face of the assault on our freedom and our democracy and on our lives. We must begin to speak truth to power. We've got 19 days and the fight will then continue because we know that truth crushed the earth shall rise again. It is so. And so it is. Ashe and amen. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, before we get to the content of your presentation, first and foremost, I have to say it is extremely humbling to have this opportunity to dialogue with you it is not often that one has the chance to be in direct conversation with a figure one has looked up to and admired. Having been reared in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Florida, Stephen Green has been a name I've heard and a person I've witnessed lead, preach, and protest since my formative years. I would be remiss if I did not express my heartfelt sense of appreciation for the encouragement you have given me in my journey. So this is indeed a consummate honor and of course, um, welcome home, Reverend. Um, when, whenever the chapel has speakers, we like to explore their formations and origin story. And so being that you were birthed into a family and really a tradition, one of social justice and liberating faith, and in I'm sure of hearing the stories of Richard Allen and the founding of the Free African Society, one can easily presume how you discern your call to do justice, walk humbly and love mercy. But I also think it's interesting to note that you were in a sense baptized in another tradition in matriculating and graduating from Morehouse, learning under Dean's tutelage and seeking to embody the moral and theological traditions that constitute the ethos of black social, of black socio-ethical leaders and moral cosmopolitans. So if you could, can you spend some time talking about your development, both as a preacher and activist? Sure, I think you uh, hit it spot on that I am who I am today because of the rearing in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You know, as a, as a son of the soil of the 11th Episcopal District, that's AME talk to tell you that we hail from Florida and the Bahama Islands, uh, but we were instilled this level of pride. Um, there is a, a little known fact about uh, the AME Church in Florida is that it, it convenes one of the largest gatherings of black young people once a year uh, in February for what is called Black Heritage Weekend. And so every February, as a child, I grew up 
um, learning the poems of our ancestors and instilling the values of oratory and of uh, of cultural en enrichment to uh, affirm my, my humanity. And so that formation as a child, I believe, helped to um, instill these principles of liberation and justice that I also saw in, in ministry at the St. Mark Church of Orlando. But And so when I uh, matriculated at Morehouse College, it was a natural synergy. It amplified what was already inside of me and, and brought out much of that uh, of the training through a uh, a pedagogy to help me understand that that I was communicating and walking in a tradition of nonviolent moral militancy and nonviolent leadership and the ethics of Martin King and Gandhi and Ikeda and Mandela and whomever else Dean decides to add and Lawrence Edward Carter is that, that that we walk into a tradition of justice of liberating faith and I believe that that is what has helped to frame me as an organizer, as an activist, as one who ha who can who can be at the president's uh, situation room at a, at a, at a table with the, in the in the, the president's uh, Roosevelt room, and also to be in the jail cell in Louisville, Kentucky. Is that 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 Morehouse taught me that it was the both and it was the the hand and the heart, the head and the heart and the hand essentially that was required to pursue and to live a life uh, that that follows the ethic of the Palestinian Jew we know to be named Jesus. Thank you, Reverend. And and you mentioned um, being in Kentucky, and uh, you know we know that as chair of um, Faith for Black Lives over the summer, you launched Justice Con to connect activists, faith leaders, and politicians. And also, we we saw you, um, you know, very recently as one of the leading activists organizing efforts in T Kentucky, fighting for the justice of Breonna Taylor. So, if you could, if you can, um, tell us about uh, some of that work and and some of those experiences. Sure, Justice Con emerged um, shortly after the untimely and um, unruly death of George Floyd, which happened to actually be on my birthday, May 25th, we watched that those eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, transform the nation. And, and I recognize that as, as leaders who were rapid response uh, or rapid responders to the trauma that we saw inflicting upon black and brown people in the streets, that we needed to convene uh, the leadership of black people, of black America, to decide on our path forward that would engage in nonviolent resistance and community organizing, as well as public policy formation. And so we began to advocate for the Justice and Policing Act to encourage Congress to develop an omnibus bill to address uh, qualified immunity, to address uh, lynching as a hate crime, to address um, uh, uh, the idea of, of, of not having a, a, a database that will protract these officers in this country. And so we, that, that's, what, that's what Justice Khan uh, emerged out of. And it was a, a, a day long conversation on Juneteenth to bring like minded leaders together to have those critical conversations so that we can begin to chart a path forward. And also, beloved, there, there's something particular about what that means to follow up in a very tangible way in Louisville, Kentucky. And so in Louisville, Kentucky, we, we, we decided to take the model that we knew worked, which is to engage community leaders and to, to not just, sometimes we, we spend so much time in theory that we don't actually engage in praxis. And so the praxis was implemented in Louisville, Kentucky to engage faith leaders, to engage community leaders, to engage organizers and activists and policymakers to have a representative like Attica Scott and, and Charles Booker, along with faith leaders like Bruce Williams and, and, and Timothy Finley Jr. And as well as community organizers like Shamika and, 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 and no justice, no peace, Aaron Jordan and Brea Tilford to engage those leaders in conversation and to put together a strategy for community-based organizing that engages in nonviolent resistance to advocate and to push a policy agenda. Uh, and so as many know, it was beyond the officers being arrested, uh, which um, that, 
you know, that, that was asinine what the, the attorney general, which we know now, who did not even advocate for charges upon uh, the murderers of Breonna Taylor, uh, but also to provide a resources and, and to uh, change the way we look at and view policing in Louisville uh, is that there were some transformative wins that took place policy wise because of the work of engaging in community based organizing. Yes, sir. And um, in, in talking about what what you said, um, and just thinking about the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Rashard Brooks, you said um, in your presentations, we may have to place our bodies on the line. And and just thinking about the countless um, deaths. Um, and, and martyrs that we have black people have witnessed throughout the history of this country, we see how the black body um, has been oppressed for um, over 400 years. And so in centering the black body um, and recognizing it as first a, a site of domination in which Black people have been oppressed um, by the oppressors, um, those who subscribe to white supremacy and patriarchy, which is at the very root of the institutions of this country. And second, the subjective experience of the body as a vehicle of terror, humiliation, and pain. And so now we see voting as a site of resistance as well, right? One in using our physical body in, in, in mobilization efforts in going to the polls, but also due to COVID and, and what you explain as draconian tactics in the alternate uh, systems of mail drop off and and voter intimidation, there might be a limitation in using our body to go to the polls to vote. And so, given um, all of this and in this and the state of emergency that we now are in, we have um, persons within Generation Z who do not see the importance or the value in their vote and the fact that their vote is their voice. And j just the other day uh, in, the, in a barbershop, I heard a young brother saying that he did not see any purpose or reason to vote. And I struggled um, to engage with him because I just could not imagine or conceptualize how one could think this way. And in conversation with an, another Morehouse brother who works on the Biden campaign and who is a director um, for the College Democrats, he said in a panel that he um, had a similar interaction in which a, a young brother had expressed he did not see the point in voting because we live in a system and are a part of a process that was not made for us, that was not made um, for our bodies. And this was seen in a recent Blackish episode. And so the question is, what do we say to Generation Z or even millennials who have this, who, who have these thoughts and these presuppositions? How do we address them? How do we engage them with only 19 days left to the election? Sure. I think that you raise a couple of concerns that I think are are very true and are very real for people is that, you know, and we have to acknowledge that where people are is is valid and that they it comes from a place of uh, consistent um, uh, frustration and, and anger at a system that has failed to completely liberate those of us who have been kissed by the sun. And I think that what, what we recognize is that the vote is a tool in the arsenal and anyone who is engaged in battle must use the tools that are available to them to be able to ward off the threats that are to come 
uh, towards us and that, that are that are infringed and inflicted upon us. And so the vote uh, in massive numbers, uh, of the, the, it provides us an opportunity to uh, attack in a very strategic way because we know that the people who are elected um, are only elected by our vote or our non-vote. Um, and, and, and I think that is what we must recognize. I think we also must recognize that we have to create a culture of civic engagement that, let, that recognizes that civic participation is beyond once every four years, but it also entails people running for office. It also entails people being able to organize and, 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 and build community power and, and recognize that electoral power is one of the tools for community power that is necessary along with economic power, along with uh, along with spiritual powers, that you need political power and electoral power. And I, I, would, I would want to use this to Lift up what I saw Reverend Terry Walker, uh, who, who mentioned in the comments about uh, our trip in 2012 to Japan after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the atomic bomb, uh, to witness the consistent deprivation um, and the impact that the hibakushu, the survivors of the bombings, um, who we spoke to, who we sat with and had lunch and dinner with. It changed my entire perspective of America as a global power and recognize that the nation in and of itself uh, that must be redeemed for the atrocities that it has committed to humankind. Uh, and, and as we recognize what it means to be a moral cosmopolitan, that we are integrated into this human family and to this planetary, um, with planetary responsibility to, 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 to respond to the environment and to the times and to ensure that we are globally responsible for, for equity, justice, and peace being the order of the day. And that faith communities and the role of faith communities to help narrativize, to provide the, the language and the tools, and maybe that is also what's necessary for uh, us to communicate to Gen Z, is that, that the narrative around voting has been so, um, uh, um, uh, uh, has been so uh, I think, um, indoctrinated in a theology or a, an understanding and an ideology of white supremacist nationalism that we're saying that voting is the answer to liberation, and it is not. Voting is a tool on the path to liberation, and that reclaims the power from the ballot box and puts the power into the people who go to the ballot box and the people who stand in the in the, in the community meetings and speak and the people who go to meet with their legislators and the people who then again show up now on the same ballot at the ballot box to begin to change and to shift the power in this nation. Right, and, and, and so a, a follow-up question to that, and uh, Reverend Reinhardt, I see your question. Um, you, you talked about building or, or fostering a, a culture of civic engagement. And um, in our home state of Florida, we see um, where voters were empowered um, to, to vote and to restore the voting rights um, of felons. But we see where um, Republicans undermined, uh, you know, what the voters did in in the legislature, um, and so how, how do how do we grapple as the consent of the governed, as you so raised, How do we grapple with these continuous attacks on um, on the right to vote in us exercising our voice and in you know queuing in past uh, discussions of um, voter intimidation with uh, re requiring um, IDs, and we know how that affects communities of colors and, and other examples. So if you can spend a little bit of time um, delineating on that. Yes. Um, the tragedy of voter intimidation and the assault on the democracy by the radical right, which I would describe them as, the GOP, has been to undermine and to add by subtracting. And they recognize that a fair fight will not 
um, will, will not be uh, advantageous to them because they recognize that the moral arc of the universe is indeed long and it is truly bending towards justice. This, you know, the assault on 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 re uh, enfranchising um, ex offenders or former offenders is, is truly an assault on the fact that um, that people in this country are, are becoming more aware because of what we are seeing take place is that even those who have been in silos and who had been uh, in hiding because they had not moved into the technology age have been thrusted into the technology age because of this pandemic. And it is exposing white supremacist nationalism for what it is in this nation and what it is in this country uh, and beyond what we see in, in white hoods. And uh, but but now the masks are different, no pun intended. Uh, and we, we are, we're able to see more clearly because of the expansion and democratization of technology, which is, which which exposes the sins of white supremacist nationalism for what it is, and so I think that 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 at its core is what is 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 motivating the GOP to do all it can to restrict the right to vote to those. Uh, people who have served their time, and particularly because they look like us. What we are almost also understand is that the goal of our criminal justice system is the goal of the is system of, uh, of exploitative capitalism, which is to dehumanize labor, which is to, not just labor, but to dehumanize human dignity and, and human personality. And so to strip uh, one of the, of their right to vote is to strip someone of the basic fabric of their human dignity in a democracy, and I think that is also a part of what has been consistent from from being sold in auction blocks, from being uh, from being from being branded with numbers, uh, from being from being uh, having families and mothers separated and 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 families being broken, is that there's always been the concept of dehumanizing black bodies and black worth that that has been intrinsic into the fabric of the GOP and truly into this nation. Right. And in, in speaking of the radical right and the GOP, this leads us perfectly into the question posed by our associate campus minister, Reverend Reinhardt asks, if and when Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed as a justice to the Supreme Court, can you talk to us about the danger of her confirmation for people of color and what should we do as a people to prepare? Yes, the um, GOP and led by Senator Lindsey Graham, who we also need to vote out uh, in South Carolina, uh, has decided to call for a vote on the um, approval out of the Judiciary Committee of uh, Judge Amy Coney Barrett um, next week. And then also the Senate Majority Leader, um, Mitch McConnell, has called for a vote on the, uh, uh, I guess, the confirmation of Judge Amy Barrett uh, on the Tuesday before the election on November the 3rd. Uh, we recognize that we are, are, are seeing uh, the writing on the wall and it is playing out directly into the playbook of the GOP and the radical right to steal this presidential election from the American people. Uh, this is not just about the next president or waiting until after the election to confirm a Supreme Court justice. This is about a Supreme Court justice who is a politician in a black robe, who is a part of a system of corruption in this country because of her loyalties and her allegiances to white supremacist nationalism. Um, that, 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 that is reflect, reflected in her religious perspectives, her views, her views on dehumanizing women's rights to choose. Uh, and, and all of that is tied to white supremacist nationalism, we understand. And, and I, I believe that what is at stake um, is the very fabric of the decency of this uh, of this democracy, and 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 what is at, at stake is our brothers and sisters who are who have been um, I guess um, impacted by the Supreme Court decision to um, no longer uh, infringe upon the rights of all human. Uh, persons or all people in this country to be able to marry whom they choose and whom they love is that 
that black people who are a part of our LGBTQIA community and our LBGT, LGBTQIA family are, are, are a risk the draconian assault on their rights because of this justice. We recognize that black women who have, uh, who have been dealt with uh, the realities of mortality rates that are fleeting and the women's rights and women's health uh, realities that show the disparities between black and white uh, Americans is that that now there is going to be another decision perhaps from a just from a from a Supreme Court that would try to determine what is best for black women's bodies. So so but particularly black communities are going to be directly affected by this decision or by this confirmation of this Supreme Court and uh, of the Supreme Court justice. And we as a people, we must begin to call upon uh, our, our, our senators to deny and to reject this uh, um, Supreme Court nominee. We should be engaged in, in mobilization and resistance. And, and, and we must recognize that we are called at this particular moment to sound the alarm and to narrativize and to communicate and to help people frame and recognize that this decision about this election will be determined by the Supreme Court. That this will, uh, as, as we already know, the Giuliani's of the world are already preparing for the court battle and are preparing for it to ascend to the Supreme Court. And with a 6-3 conservative deadlock, we know that it will lean towards the direction of Donald Trump. The question is, will the people rise up against the uh, draconian decisions that we know are to be made? And this fight will be won with the people battling for the truth and for the best of this democracy. Um, and, 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 and Reverend, I think it's interesting um, to talk about the political maneuvers of the radical right in their claim that their ideologies is based in faith. And I had uh, one of my professors of religion the other day in class say he was convinced that evangelicals did in fact just not read the Bible. And so the, the question arises, how does one uh, account for the, their psyche? Um, is it at best simply cognitive dissonance or worse, just flat out um, a, a conflation of their um, racist nature um, with scripture? I mean, how does one read the social gospel of Jesus Christ and, and come to those conclusions? What are, what are your thoughts on that? I don't think they're reading the social gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that, that's my thought on that, is that we, we recognize that we are are dealing with people who have uh, given life to rhetoric, a, a, a language of harm, a language of violence, a language of, uh, of, of, of detriment to our people. And, and, and um, uh, it's, it, it has become one of those things that separates and divides us because there is a, a, a clear distinction between what we know to be true and what we know to be uh, to be false, and it requires us as people who understand the the sacred text and recognize that you cannot have the sacred without the social and the social without the sacred. That they are both uh, that they both are, are one, and in our African philosophy, we understand it to be true. Thank you, and and trying to to shift gears a little bit, um, preeminent. African American historian and, and scholar Sterling Stuckey, in his book um, *Slave Culture*, he talks about a, um, a a folk tale rooted in the Yoruba tradition, known as the the tale of the buzzard, in which it was held that the vomit of a buzzard um, was the dead flesh of the enslaved, and that the buzzard in this instance represented those persons that 
the white captives went back to Africa to um, catch and to enslave. And they were once those um, African chiefs who sold off their own people. And so what um, Sterling Stuckey really reveals is that the ultimate African punishment of selling out one's people is living in an intermediary place, um, not seeing the face of God and being cursed to roam the earth. And when thinking about the recent um, headlines of Ice Cube collaborating with Trump in the Platinum Plan and seeing Shaquille O'Neal um, admit that this was the first time that he had voted and really um, grappling with this whole idea that uh, research shows that about 18% of Black men under 50 support Donald Trump. How do we struggle with this? How do we engage those Black folks? Because there are some Black women who support Trump as well. How do we call them to consciousness in a sense? Sure. And I think that we must give people a little more grace because I was listening to Malcolm X, The Ballot or The Bullet, as he talked about the grace that's necessary for people who may have ideological differences. Um, integration or separation. But yet they have the same goal of freedom. And I would suggest that the grace that we should give leaders who may not agree with us ideologically like um, Ice Cube, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, is the grace to understand that they may have this common goal of freedom and their pathway is ideologically different. My challenge is, is that people are giving a grace to President Trump undeservedly because of the last four years, his record has been dismal in African-American policies. Outside of the criminal justice bill, the First Step Act, and his investment in historically black colleges and universities, black people have not received any seismic investment uh, into our communities under this administration. And the reality is this, that when people talk about Trump and beyond, they talk about the fact that they have not seen sizable investments in policies to eliminate poverty, eradicate racism, and to annul this nation of its militarism of, uh, or its militarizing industrial complex ever. So people are drawn to this frustration of not seeing the progress that they had so often thought was possible in a democracy. And so what I think this moment represents and what we are having to do and narrativize in this moment is that the pandemic further exposed that America is yet capable of transforming herself as she showed us with a $2 trillion CARES Act, that when it comes to a moment of, uh, of controversy, when it comes to a moment of pain, that it can find the resources to invest in the citizens of this nation. And so what we have to recognize is that people are frustrated ultimately with what they see as this fail, frailty of democracy and see Donald Trump consistently as a part of that lineage. And they see challengingly uh, Joe Biden as a part of that lineage. What we have to do is articulate that this moment is beyond Joe Biden. We are not voting only for Joe Biden. We are voting for what comes beyond Donald Trump. 
and beyond Donald Trump is a people who decide to stand up for themselves and advance policies and that will affirm our own humanity and provide the resources that are necessary to close the racial wealth gap, to close the, the, the education inequity uh, gap or the education uh, gap, to close the realities of, of our criminal justice challenges in this nation. And so we, we, we must help narrativize for people that we must take this beyond the realities of what we see. Because seeing with Donald Trump, there's not ultimate liberation either. And so we must consistently advocate for pulling and pressing ourselves to realize the ultimate beloved world house as Dean Carter so eloquently stated. Yes, sir. So one final question before getting to Dean's question and then a, a question we ask all of our moderators. You talked about um, a, a failing democracy and in thinking that this is the first time that a president has failed to commit to a peaceful um, transition of power, um, it, it seems as if the country is almost on the dawn or has been at the cusp of fascism, a fascist dictator. And so in thinking about Dr. King's uh, final work, his last book, Where Do You Go From Here in his fifth chapter, he clearly lays out, a, he uses his prophetic voice to lay out a, a plan and identify next steps uh, for the black community. Given that the election is uh, 19 short days away and either way the election goes, it can potentially, our reality can be something or it can become something that is dangerous and that we have never seen before, whether if President Trump wins or Vi Vice President Joe Biden wins. So I, I asked the same question that King was grappled with. Where, where do you, in the near future, where do you think uh, is next for us to go? Well, I, I think that you raise a serious concern, and this is a concern that I consistently wrestle with, is that we, in the immediate, in the in the what I like to call the pregame, we must ensure that everyone we know votes between now and November the third. That we need to ensure that we have massive civic participation and voter engagement. And so every Sunday, we are encouraging in states that have early voting people to take their souls to the polls. And every day, people to march to the polls, stroll to the polls, shimmy at the polls, walk to the polls, feed at the polls, read a book at the polls, whatever it takes. We, we, I, I believe that people need to get to the polls. Uh, the fight, the game will begin over November the 3rd when the ballots begin to be counted and the results begin to reflect. And I believe that overwhelmingly, the majority of the nation will choose light over darkness. I, I believe that, I hope that. I, I, I am invested into a cosmic companion that will allow me to believe that goodness will triumph over evil. However, comma, I recognize that there are um, human interventions that will falter and, 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 and alter the stability or the equilibrium of what justice looks like. So in the intermediate, I believe it is imperative that we stand on guard as poll watchers and witnesses and witness the count and the counting take place in many communities. That we show up as a form of solidarity and as a form of nonviolent resistance as watchers and warriors who are ensuring that the system of democracy that we have subscribed to, it, it works through its own kinks and that the results will be final. I also believe that we are going to find ourselves dealing with not just the domestic challenges, but the foreign challenges that we know that are coming from Russia and other nations and the threats of white supremacist violence in our own country. So I believe it's going to require us to be skillful in our strategy. 
is that we are not intending to put people on the front lines to die willingly and going up against militias that are deranged and full of people who are engulfed in fury and hatred. That we think of a strategic approach to nonviolent resistance that will be powerful and yet poignant, will be uh, sophisticated and yet strategic. And I believe that that is what it, it, uh, many uh, of us who are who are strategists and thinking of ways to um, reimagine this democracy and to assert our moral agency are thinking of that. And so um, we, we intend to respond in a way that is surprising and yet um, and yet strategic, um, prophetic, but yet powerful, uh, militant, but yet moral. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, powerful. I, mar I marveled uh, in your response. The Reverend Dean Carter says, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did not go to school to be a civil rights leader. He wanted to pastor a church, do some teaching, and become president of Morehouse College. What career path would you be working toward if you were, in, if you were indeed free at last? Uh, well, to be free at last, Dean, is the goal of every Morehouse man. Uh, I believe that I would also be still pastoring a congregation. I, I pastored for three years a congregation in New Jersey, beloved congregation, heard Amy Church, that allowed me to develop um, my gifts as a community leader and as a parish leader. Um, and I believe that I will one day return to the pulpit in a capacity as senior pastor. And I, and I, I so desire and yearn for that um, again, I have had to respond to this moment and I've had to respond to the challenges facing our people. And I've recognized that now my parish is larger than a, than a congregation that I report to a bishop, but it engages the complexities of the systems and structures and helps to empower leaders and people to begin to respond uh, decisively, um, that the future of our of our nation is in our hands, and that this global movement, because we're building with people from across the diaspora and even throughout the world who are responding at this moment, is that we need a global transformative movement grounded in agape energy, in this love soul force that is able to stand up against fascism and tyranny and this cool day Trump that we anticipate uh, in the short and coming days. Certainly, Ashe and Amen to that. The last question is a question we ask all of our speakers in an attempt to expand and broaden the horizons of our chapel assistants and all of our students. We ask our speakers um, three books, uh, three seminal or foundational uh, books in various disciplines um, that you would recommend to us. And sure. Uh, I would recommend Jesus and the Disinherited, like everybody who comes to the King Chapel would recommend. Um, also, I would recommend Gary Dorian's Social Democracy in the Making, Political and Religious Roots of European Socialism. Also, this text called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. I'm reading that as well. Uh, and for a guilty pleasure, I started reading Lovecraft Country to go along with my desire to um, watch the show and be engaged and see how it ends. So I'm also looking at Lovecraft Country. So, Yes, sir. Um, well, Reverend, the time has been well spent. I thank you so much for coming, for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule 
to come and share with us and to be in this virtual gathering space um, to talk about uh, this reality that is currently ours. Um, and hopefully it is indeed a, a, a era, an epoch of history that I believe that with the help of the Almighty, we will traverse, travail and triumph. So thank you, Reverend Green. Thank you. And I want to just say publicly how warmed I am by your presence and by your leadership that you have displayed tonight. You are one of the best that Morehouse has to offer. And I am so uh, overwhelmed to see another brother from the African Methodist Episcopal Church from Jacksonville, one who has uh, received a scholarship in honor of my own beloved cousin. And uh, I am just so uh, overwhelmingly blessed by your witness and what you mean to the African Methodist Episcopal Church, what you mean to Morehouse College, and what you will mean to the world, and who you are to the world, and what you mean now to the world. And eyes have not seen, and ears have not heard what you shall become. And if there's anything that I can do personally to help you and to assist you in your journey, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. I am just blessed that Morehouse College is still producing her best uh, through you. And the world will be forever grateful for your witness and for your work. Thank you. I received that. And Ashe, it is our sincere hope that all of our viewers, that you thoroughly enjoyed this Thurman Thursday and will delight in the remaining virtual homecoming activities. On behalf of our founding dean, the Reverend Dr. Edward Lawrence Carter Sr., Associate Campus Minister, the Reverend Quincy James Reinhardt, and President Gabriel D. Cloud, we ask that you would be so kind to join us this homecoming Sunday in our Vesper Hour at 5.30 p.m., where the chapel will welcome another son back home, the Reverend Eddie Anderson, class of 2012, the pastor of McCarty Memorial Christian Church in Los Angeles, California. Until next time, be blessed, my brother and my sister. Go with God and, my, and may thine grace follow you. Thank you.